How's it going? This is the second installment of my MASM 32-bit Windows Assembly Language Programming. It's not totally imperative that you watch the first one, but if this one's a little too much of a step ahead, then of course I recommend finding that video and watching it. But anyway, on this one, what I want to cover is overlapping with where the last one left off basically is just creating a really simple window and then kind of knocking that down to the low level syntax a little bit more kind of get out of that MASM specific high level syntax and get more into the general assembly language flow of things which isn't that big of a deal at all um, especially on that little tiny example and then also I want to bridge the gap between the C level, like a simple C level, or excuse me, like C programming type of a application that just does a basic window that's resizable with the minimize, maximize boxes, you know, a typical window, not just a little OK dialog box. And we're going to cut and paste that code into a editor and convert it to the high level syntax MASM code. Not going to go to low level syntax with that one because there's too much opportunity for some garbage in there and I just don't feel comfortable presenting that right now but anyway this should be a total mindful for right now okay so the two main things that I'm going off of here is this tutorial by Jeff Wang and I'm not following it exact just really loosely and if you come down to about page 11. Of course, there's other good information in here. Just really basic, simple information. But if you come down to page 11 here, it starts out with that type of example program. Here's a fully functional program that shows you how to use some of the, I'm going to go full screen with this, shows you how to use some of the instructions and registers, see if you can figure it out. Uh, this one actually that's page 10, I'm sorry. So page 11, basic windows. Windows programs are usually composed of one or more windows, thus to be a real Windows programmer, one must at least know how to make a simple window. Unfortunately, it's not that easy, but this will guide you through it. It is pretty easy. There's a lot of little hangups you can get into, but it's nothing to be scared of. Um, he's briefly mentioning the high level statements of like the if conditionals and a uh, while loop which I'll cover those and then a typical function syntax this is the high level function syntax and it you know you have your name of your function you say proc for procedure and then you list any variables followed by their types basically the reverse order of how you would do that in C you have your function code and then you call ret which is the equivalent of return usually before you do that if you want to return a zero you'll uh, put a zero in the EAX register which is that EAX is your typical return value register especially if it's just like a simple number or something okay the return value stored in EAX register I guess I could have read that and there they're invoking this is how they call the function in the high level sense and then once you're back to the caller of said function it can then that return value be left in EAX so you can copy it into like a variable name or whatever you had plans for if you care about it probably at least do an error check on it um, variables these are looks like global global and local okay so variables are allocated in the memory let you store data they can be very useful if you don't have enough registers there are two types of variables global variables and local variables Global variables are placed in the dot data section if they are initialized in the data dot data question mark session section if they are uninitialized or the dot const section if they are initialized and won't be changed. You can actually cram everything in dot data, but it is better practice to put it in its correct section. That way the assembler can complain if something doesn't line up and also like if you try and edit a constant value and then also that those constant values get stored in a place of memory where they don't have permission in the, uh, the virtual machine to get written to. 
Okay, local variables are placed inside a function are temporary storage for use inside the function. They cannot be initialized when created. Their syntax is local name colon type. And uh, this part right here, it says there are several types. Some good ones to know are byte, word, and D word. Word is actually only two bytes and D word is actually only four bytes. Eight bytes would be a quad word. Okay, so that's I think the only typo I found in there. And then when we come down into here, simple window, Windows programs have two main parts. A win main creates the window and contains something called the message loop. The message loop watches for messages and dispatches them. The second part is the callback function, win proc, which is an, like an abbreviation for Windows procedure, which is where the messages are sent to. This is where you handle your mouse events, repainting, etc. Pretty much everything. Um, and the reason that winproc, you know, you have your main function, win main, and the reason winproc's a separate function is because it gets called by the Windows system itself a lot of times. So, most times, so that it's a callback function. That's why it, you know, you don't want to call win main and have to run through that whole thing every single time you get zillions of events a second, potentially. Okay, and then he basically goes through and covers all this stuff like a little prototype like in the C language where it's not even necessary it's only if you want to do your uh, what is it why would win main need a prototype right there I don't know that it would maybe win proc would need a prototype if you want to pit it after win main but anyway you can pit prototypes for everything at the top of your file if you want then it doesn't matter what order your uh, functions are implemented in and it also gives you like a nice brief little summary of like which functions are in that file and maybe how many parameters they take and stuff like that okay here's data you can see all the string variables are included in this dot data so they're global to that translation unit to that file and that might seem like oh man that that's weird you know I can't just do an immediate string and pass it in like right then and there it's some function called nested in the code and if you think about it um, the best way to kind of think about assembly I think is to think of it like how Java pushes that kind of like every object in its own file or every class in its own file I should say so kind of going with that for one thing you shouldn't have like you shouldn't think these are going to be global throughout your entire program necessarily if you have a medium or large size program but they can uh they're more like member variables like you know member variables are global to that that unit you know so when you think about it global is a word that's like that whole thing about being anti-globals are it's really misconstrued because like win main is global win proc is global there's so if you really think about it like a lot of stuff is global pretty much kind of arguably everything or at least the module that it's encapsulated inside of or whatever the, those the object whatever it's it's all you know that object's probably globally accessible right and if it's not then there's a lot of ways to to get to stuff from the outside I just I think it's sort of it's just a mistake to sit there and say like global values are bad and then it's like well your main entry point of any program in any just about any programming language I can think of is globally accessible so therefore your whole program's bad you know it it's just whatever and if you think about it I don't know if I started to bring it up yet but internationalizing a program and having lots of different or even if you just want variations on the strings for whatever other reasons maybe but especially with internationalization it's common to put all of your string resources all of your text in its own file and then name that like something dot en for english or whatever and then have that pulled into your program then somebody can take that and line for line just without having any too much code cruft they can translate that to spanish or whatever other language you know and then at the flip of a switch you can just change the whole interface language of your entire program you know so in that sense those would be globals you know those would be in a file that's like potentially globally accessible within 
or at least within whatever scope, you know, leaning towards global access. So that being said, those are just some ways to think about, um, you know, that you wouldn't want one really huge assembly language file and, you know, just think of it like a class and the so-called globals are your member variables, especially for the strings. And then of course, thinking of that benefit, if you just put all those in one of those include files, the .inc files, and then you can just include English text or whatever you want, you know, and then bam, it's all there. It's out of your way, so you don't have to think about it unless you really care what that specific message is. And you can name the variable something descriptive so you know like oh that's a class name there I don't have to go it's not like variable one and then you go look that up oh oh win class you know and jump in between files so anyway and then this is uninitialized data which is basically the same type of syntax as up here but you put a question mark instead of giving it defining the data and that's just like I said, completely uninitialized, and then the, the last option would be the dot const for all of your constants, which are basically like the EQU, kind of more or less. All right, and then you come in here, your dot code segment, which actually gets changed to dot text according to the historical convention of what section it's in. You might see that in other assemblers and stuff, but one of those ways that Microsoft kind of filled that in <laughs> they made it make more sense because it is your code section so they went with the more descriptive name even though whatever it kind of counters the historical thing and then it has to be you have to have like some type of label conventionally called start an entry point into your program and that's kind of like the real main that if you think of it like the lower level assembly language main win mains like the more a little bit higher level uh like Windows main obviously and the same thing with main and like a C program C actually does some startup code for you and stuff and that's taken care of under the hood and then it calls your main so that's why it has to be called main and stuff but really if you you can get tricky MASM is a crazy every hour I learn more and more every day like it, it's just a trip how much it's like 10 different assemblers compiled into one so there's 10 different ways at least to do just about anything you can think of with this thing for better or worse okay so you come in here you start and what they're doing is they're getting I don't want to get too technical but this is like if you're going through this file I'm basically going to cover the same stuff a little bit different a little bit slightly simpler arguably um and then you can come back if you're following along and you can, if you want to, you can type all this stuff in or cut and paste it. It's almost as much work either way because of the formatting, like everything will just be all wacky when you paste it in. At least it was for me. And, uh, you know, so you got the trade off between tidying that up or just hand typing it yourself. Either way, just do what you got to do to get that into its own file and kick it around if you care about specifically how things are done here they're slightly different than how I'm going to do it but for the most part I'm going to do I'll show you so to find that you just type win asm tut into a search engine and it's right here doc lag out org operating system windows win asm tut dot pdf windows assembly programming tutorial I'm going to click that and then it looks like it's taking me to the page I left off at maybe. So if we go back to the very top up here, see Jeff Wang, December 10th, 2003. So you know that you have the right file there. Just get back to that one. Okay, and then this other one here, this is the, uh, the Forgers Win32 API programming tutorial, real simple basic intro to Windows uh, 32 API which is basically identical to the Windows 64 API except for a few little things out on the fringe okay so to get there you type in like forgers um, API or win API or whatever and it should be pretty much the top link there winprog.org tutorial 
Forger's Win32 API tutorial. All right, so all that being said, then I'm gonna click on this getting started up here. And what this tutorial is all about, I don't know, no too big of a deal on all that. This is the simplest Win32 program. I don't remember if I covered this exact one in the last thing, but I covered something pretty similar if I didn't. But I'm either way, I'm gonna expand on this a little bit here. So what I did is I highlighted it from the end up to the top, right click, copied, and then we got a new file here. I'm gonna paste it in and I'm gonna file save as just anywhere you have read and write permission. I'm gonna go in here and save it over what was the simplest? And if I, it's C, C++ right now. So if I run my C, C++ compiler, what does it say? Unresolved symbol. Okay. So what I do is in my editor, instead of um, just for anybody who does mess with the C and C++ stuff, I don't hard code the command like I had to do all these tools myself I go in like all these right here these compile and links I did those right in here so I had to like come up with this command line right here and everything so I didn't want to force it to include libraries that it didn't need and everything and so the other option you know that's the command line option way of doing it but the other way is just kind of like we do in the assembly languages just to include it hard coded into your uh, source file here so this is the way you do that in Microsoft C and we need user 32 lib that's what it was complaining about so now if we run it it will just know yeah go ahead and include that lib file and then it can access message box here and everything should run so there it is no goodbye cruel world that is the um, the sample from that Forger's tutorial right here. And we go back and look at that. It's just basically calling that win main and passing it some stock parameters. And then we get down in here in between these brackets is the meat of it. And it just calls message box Windows API function, which is Per, you know one of those really just obviously super general things like if I go to you know like this that's a different type of window that's not a message box but it's more standard in general than that right null means it doesn't have an owner so nothing to worry about right now it's just a lot of stuff half the stuff you see with the windows programming is kind of redundant boilerplate and it's just there so that if you want to get tricky or you know a little more fancy with how your program is working or customized or whatever you have those options there but just keep in mind that half the stuff is just going to be kind of redundant like that so you got the null and then you've got the the message and then you have the caption and then what style of message box you know there's error boxes exclamation whatever different types of boxes okay is just the one with the simple one single okay button and then we return a zero, which in case you didn't know, that just means it's basically how you exit the function and say everything's fine. Okay, so we saw that. I'll run it one more time. You can see there it is. It's that's that's it. Nothing fancy. It's got an X, it's got an okay. We have the caption there. You shrink that down. You can see the note, all that stuff. I can even click the X to get it to go away. Okay. And now we're going to convert this to assembly language real quick. And what I do here is that basic boilerplate at the top, unlock the 32-bit instructions, and set up the model as flat. And the, call, the default calling convention is standard call, which all the Windows functions that I'm aware of use. And they that just basically means that the the called function, the callee, like we're the caller in this context, we're the caller of message box, right? And then inside message box, it becomes the callee wherever that code is. And as the callee, it has to clean the stack. So it has to clean up and ba effectively destroy all these values that we put in a pile and send to it. It's got to knock those off the pile. 
and that's just a convention that's the standard call convention which is windows um in c the caller is responsible for the standard c calling convention you can use different calling conventions but they're responsible for doing that for um the caller is responsible for clearing that stack the parameters on the stack but standard call is usually better unless you have a variable number of arguments standard calls always the best and standard call sort of in between that c calling convention and a thing called sys call and sys call is caller cleans the stack or excuse me callee cleans the stack pushes all registers i don't quote me on that i can't remember it's it's the more extreme version of standard call i guess it just doesn't take variable arguments would maybe be the difference all right so if we go in here we're turning this into assembly i'm going to go ahead and do the option case map none and pretty much all of these can be done with command line parameters if you wouldn't but this is the way most people do it is just include in the source file all right then we'll do include and this is an include file and then include directory and i'm assuming you're using obviously MASM32 or at least that you have it installed otherwise you're probably smart enough to figure out how to adapt this to use the Windows SD platform SDK or whatever you got going on okay just do that one and then this one would convert to include lib a lot of one-to-one -one conversion with this stuff and this can be in the lib folder just like that and then down here this is basically saying it returns a an integer a d word so in 32-bit programming right we're gonna see that in the eax register whenever a function's done running nine times out of ten or whatever the value is gonna be if it can fit it will be in the eax register by convention so we know that that's just saying okay check EAX that's standard we get rid of that this win API calling convention if you look in the header files that actually translates to standard call just like what we have up here so we can just go ahead and knock that out because we already have that set as the default and then we can declare this as a procedure define it and we just go over here and flip the type and put it on the other side of the variable the parameter name here just like this pretty straightforward so this is converting to that high level so-called high level syntax of uh, MASM and pretty straightforward for the most part there's definitely a few little things to keep in mind that was an int that this is supposed to be so that will just be D word okay get rid of that brace and come down here we need to invoke message box I can go ahead and switch this to the assembler highlighting invoke message box first parameter null and last parameter message box okay it doesn't matter if you leave those trailing semicolons because they're just comments so they're optional in MASM but I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of them and then when you want to return zero you just use the return function but right before you call it you effectively want to move um, into EAX the value zero like that because like I said that return value goes into EAX right well the tricky thing is that most people do is they just XOR EAX against itself because it's a little bit quicker um, it's not a huge deal but it's a pattern you'll see probably more often than not so I'll just go ahead and use it and if we're in assembly language it's nice to do little optimization you know you'll start seeing common optimizations like that and they'll just become like a standard pattern okay and then right here is just going to be win main end procedure oops and this needs to go into a dot code section and this these strings like i was saying they need to get out of here so what i'll do is i'll get rid of note and we'll say that's um message 
caption. And we can go right up here and do a const, just like, or a dot data, whatever. But these are going to be read only strings, so I'm going to be more specific and say const, and this is going to be message caption. And it's going to be an ANSI string, so it's going to be defining bytes paste it there and it's a zero terminated string we don't get that little nicety from C we have to type it ourselves no big deal come down here oops not doing good copying that one so this is the actual message so we'll call it message text and that's gonna be line it up nice Right there, save that. Oops, oh, saved over simple as C. Oh well, I'll save as. Don't do that. Rename it, save it early, save it off in simplest.asm. And I'm going to replace my copy of it that I worked on earlier. Okay. This is a common mistake that I always do. I, I'm going to leave it in, but what I should do is type offset right here instead of trying to pass that because it's a pointer. You know, whenever you pass a string, you're effectively passing a pointer to that first character of the string, and uh, you're not passing the whole string, right? Otherwise, we would be able to probably just do an immediate value, but instead we're carving this space out in a special little spot, and then we're passing the address of that first letter we're not passing the letter the number of the box of memory that that letter stored in right so that's why we say offset message text so it doesn't literally just try and dump the string back in there like we removed but right here i'm supposed to do the same thing but i'm not going to just to illustrate an error well actually i'll just go ahead and try and do it right to start and make sure the program's working okay double check so what it's going to complain about is i don't have an end down here I'll run it and get that undefined symbol message box. Well, that's a good one to complain about. So what I need to do is include the user32.inc file, which has the actual, you know, this is the binary data here, and this one's sort of the source code data. So this will say, what's available in here and message box will be one of those things i'm going to specifically call message box a which i recommend you do even in c programs okay what's it saying indirective so always read the errors right so right here you can see error indirective required at the end of the file so i need to wrap Basically where you want your code to start, which we want to start, and by convention it's called start for the label. So we just slap a label above when main, and right below it we end that label. So then it technically ends with end. Then we can run it, and there we get that same message box that we did with the C program, right? But you can see it's slightly different, but for the most part, same thing. You have, you know, your top level header fodder, and this is kind of like the um, includes the .h files in the C, and this is kind of like that pragma thing. Once again, I could also type this in its own form on the command line to include it, but I chose to just go ahead and include it in the source file because it's always necessary, and then I don't have to change my little tools up here for tons of variations or manually type it every time. Then we have some global constants. So this is in C, you just define those outside the scope of a function, right? And put the const keyword in front of them. So that's effectively what's going on right there. And then we have our code section and we have our start, a little bit redundant. And when main procedure, the uh, parameters. And of course we call the message box and then we put a zero in EAX and we return. And that ends the win main, ends the start. So that's what's all going on there, just like it was in the C program for the most part. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of one of these offsets to show you what the error would look like. Shift F5. And then you can see right there, it's encountered a problem, whatever. No description, it's just like this runtime error thing. I'm going to close that and this. That's when you know you have a 99% chance you have a pointer error going on. So 
you'll know that it's probably like one of those offset things. You're not doing right. You're passing the actual variable. You're you're actually trying to pass at this stuff instead of the location of this first character. All right. And to show you what I'm doing at the command line here, if I open up a command window, and then which file am I using? Simplest.asm, so if I dir simplest, right there you can see the file, and I can type ml, which version of ml am I using? So I'm using 6.15, I'll show you how to get a copy of that in just a second. So right here, here's I did ML uh, forward slash question mark. You can see all the options. If you don't use the stock one that came with MASM32, you're not going to be able to do the link on the same line, but you can just run it as a separate command. Pretty much just get rid of the forward slash and run it as a second command. All right. And what I'm doing here is I'm ML forward slash C to assemble only. And then we want forward slash cough especially with the MASM6, you have to definitely tell it that you want the cough format. Should be the default on later ones, but either way it won't hurt it to pass it. Otherwise this one will generate this OMF, but we want this cough. Okay, layout of the executable file. And then we pass it that simplest .asm file, and that should work. Okay, so now we have the simplest object file is created simple list dot star this exe is old so not very old oh that's right I was running it in the IDE in my little editor over here so that's why it has a pretty new timestamp on it but you can see we're at 637 638 now with the ASM and the OBJ and this is one from earlier that I was messing with way earlier obviously okay so now we're gonna link it and that will actually, since this is our new object we're working with, we want to link it and pass it a subsystem. Since this is going to use the graphical capabilities, Windows, and we need user32 lib was already included in here, so we shouldn't need to pass that. And then maybe just the name, let's see. Looks like it did good. Let's do the timestamp on the EXE is now 639. And if we look at the current time, if you subtract two from this digit right here, you'll get 640. So that is in five seconds. So obviously that looks like it compiled. Didn't get any error messages up there. So I'll run it, simple list, and there we have it. So that's how you can do that at the command line manually. Of course, you'll need to make sure that uh, MASM is in your path. So, see here, here's what my path looks like. We have, I have MASM 32 bin twice for some reason. And then Python's not necessary. And the rest of it looks pretty stock. So, just as long as you tack on MASM 32 slash bin on the front of your uh, path there, you should be good. And if we look at all the environment variables, here they are. The ones that matter is the path, of course, for running programs. Um, I don't even see lib. Lib isn't even set. So includes not set. But that doesn't matter because we include the full, pretty much absolute path for the lib and include files. So we don't have to have those set. Inside of my editor, it doesn't matter. I have it set up so that the paths are automatically included, so I could get rid of that whole path. You can also put like a C if you have various drive letters or whatever. And you can even use forward slashes if you really wanted to. And I'll just run this in my editor since you know effectively what command lines I'm using to get this stuff. All right, what else now? Now I wanted to stretch this out quickly and show you that just kind of kick it around a tiny bit show you you can use the tiny model that works I thought I had it compiling to a dot com with the tiny maybe if you just change the output of it, it you might be able to get a dot com out of it 
I'm pretty sure I found 64-bit.com files on my computer and I found 32-bit.com files on Windows XP. Um, when I say my computer, I'm talking about my non-virtual system, my Windows 8.1 system out there. But anyway, um, option case map, you might as well need, leave that. You don't always need it in the simplest examples, but I run into problems if I start including a bunch of stuff. I thought I could get away with it in the last one and then it caused me some stuff. So I just decided to go ahead and start putting that back in. Once again, that can be replaced with a command line. What else is noteworthy in here? Okay, let's go ahead and make this not use any of this high level junk, like invokes high level. Offset I don't really consider to be high level. Um, proc is high level. All this whole syntax is high level. So we'll basically get rid of that stuff. So the first thing we'll do here is use the non-high level form of invoke. We're calling a procedure maybe I should say. So what we're going to do is we pass the parameters right to left and then we call message box. So call message box A. And then so really what I can do if I want to go upward and if you want to think of it like a snake or a worm or something this would be the head and then you know basically the the parameters will be relative you want to push the parameters relative to this name as they are here so you can see nulls the closest to the name right that's one way to remember it so right here we can say push and then zero is the same as null it's shorter and easier so I do that a lot and then we want to push the offset see where it's going of message text and then push the offset message caption and then MB OK which is also just a zero I believe so we can just do that or I could do MB OK it's totally alright to do it that way too and I could have used null down lower as well so now if we double check it here since it is standard call I don't have to worry about cleaning the stack when it comes back because that will be taken care of for me inside of message box which is very nice so I'm going to hit shift F5 well that wouldn't really apply to anybody else so there you can see it's still working no complaints here so that's cool and then what if so we can get rid of this now and the other option with message box or excuse me with invoke is if you have a bunch of parameters running off the screen or whatever you can stack them downward like message box a comma and then I could go like well, let me give it a line here I could go like this and do something like this more. But otherwise, I mean, you're not, it's not saving you all that much always, you know, to do the high level waiver. If you are careful about the way you craft it, you can do the other way just as easy, you know, obviously. Or sometimes just as easy. Sometimes it's, there are reasons that the high level stuff's there and you run into those situations. So for this one, one other thing I can do is I can just change these all to D words. Let's go ahead and do that. Because we know a handle to an instance is a 32-bit D word. You just have to kind of know ahead of time, which I mean, if you just guess the vast majority of times, that's what's going to be. And then long pointer is going to be a D word to a string or otherwise. So we'll paste that. So we have all D words now. I'm going to run it, save and run it. And there it is. So it's still working. Um, now we can get rid of, let's make win main a label. And I'm just going to comment out all that other, all this other stuff's deactivated now. It's behind that semicolon comment. Then come down here, comment out end start and make it say end excuse me when main and comment that out so this code is all disabled now and it's just this end when main which I've replaced the start convention and just turned it into a label so it's gonna jump in here now we can get away with this because this is an ultra simple thing but otherwise you'd want to at least create a new um, 
stack frame. So what you do is you would push the value of EBP, the base pointer, you'd push that onto your stack, and then you would move into your base pointer the current value of the stack pointer that's talk pointing at the so-called top of the stack. So that would just move, you know, that whole little window up and give you a fresh stack frame for your new function that's now being entered. But since we know that we're not going to use any of these values that were any parameters and we're not creating any new local variables, we don't have to do this. I'll go ahead and run it. It should work. Yep, still working. Oh, and then a pointer style error right there. Oh, the reason I think for that was because I didn't clean it up down here. So this is the prologue, what's called the prologue of the function. A lot of times you won't see that if you're using the high level syntax, but when you go lower level, you got whatever you do right here in this beginning part, you need to undo down here before you exit. So as part of that return thing, we'll do, uh, we'll pop into EBP, which since we didn't push anything else, we know where that stack pointer effectively is. It's pointing at uh, this EBP was the last thing we pushed onto the stack. So that is what this is pointing out right here. And so when we say pop into EBP, we're effectively just popping this old value back into here. All right, and let's see what does what that does now. No errors. Okay, so that's what happened there. But like I said, we can skip this because we know we're not even touching it anyway, so nobody will ever know. And there we go, that worked, no errors. So that's pretty much about all I want to cover right there, I think. We can kind of simplify this a little bit to show how of course, if you did want to use those parameters, they're located relative. That's one of the reasons you do this whole push EBP, create that new frame. So now, effectively, your extended base pointer right here, your new one, is pointing at your old one where it's saved in the stack. And everything you do from then on out throughout your function, you do relative to that base pointer. One thing too you can do is you can push any registers. Like if you start using registers down here, you should pretty much, I mean, EAX, EBX, and EDX are usually okay to trash. That's pretty much expected because they could very likely be used for return values. So the caller should have preserved those. But if you want to be extra safe or whatever, you can push those ones too. It's all up to you. And especially the more you know about the programmers programs inner workings but anyway you just push whatever registers you want to preserve if you're doing this more old-fashioned low-level way and then you'd go ahead and um or excuse me first you'd move the base pointer then you'd push that stuff you could really do it any way you want but you need to just keep track of how you do it and it's better to stick to a convention and one thing we can do too is look at how this stuff's compiled so if I go to tools and then generate listing here, is it gonna work? Oh, you know what? I shouldn't have done this one. It's too big for a very specific reason. That was another high level thing I wanted to get rid of was these include files right here. I'm gonna get rid of those. And then what I do is I come down here and I can just say X turn and the only one we use is message box A and it's a procedure and so I can just define it like that of course there is the proto style one I could have done uh, message box A and then say this is a prototype for a procedure and then say what uh, has a D word and of course, if I did include one of those Windows include files, the you know the actual main Windows include file, then I'd have access to all of those symbolic types, and I could say you know this is a handle to a window or whatever type. But we know it's a D word, so it's easier just to say do this um, four times. And I need to remember to put that colon there. 
All right, so that's one way to do it. I'll show the comment that out for now, and we'll just use this first way for now. And then the other thing is, if you do it this first way, you need to say how many total bytes, like these are four bytes each, four times four, so I just say 16. So that's sort of the trade off is how crafty you want it and where you want your craft or whatever if you are going this route. And then down here, I'll just add the 16, and I think this should work. No, it's not working because error undefined symbol message box okay totally makes sense because I stopped including that windows include file so like I said I can just change that to a zero or some other value and then I'll run that again there you can see it's all working again uh, let's change this to a one you know what it's not message box okay necessarily we'll see you can see it's an okay or cancel box now let's try two and you can look these up in the API documentation. Ooh, let's retry, ignore, abort. Let's retry. Okay. Of course, that's going to send back a return code that if we cared about would be an EAX right here. And then we could deal with that. At least if I remember correctly. Yeah, that should be the way. Okay. And then instead of X turn, this way is the more high level way. This is what's going on in those ink files. Oh, we're still calling it 16 down here, so we need to get rid of that since we are doing that a little bit different right there. And that worked. So you can see with uh, basically based, you could do a really, what like a polymorphic, I guess you could do kind of a loose polymorphosis morphism with this maybe even a more strict polymorphism with this one okay that covers everything that's important about that of course all this stuff is just extra we can get rid of that we can get rid of the epilogue and prologue here don't need any of that we get rid of that one include that one so you can see how this is completely low level I think I'm gonna say it is this is like pretty much as low level as you'd want to get I think could be wrong I could be missing something completely obvious but I think so so I'm gonna run it and it's mad because it can't find message box a because I didn't put an at 16 there and there we go Okay, so that's a lot of time on that one. Now I'm going to have to really book it through the next one. That's how to convert that simple little hello world message box into assembly language, which wasn't that complicated, right? Okay, now we're going to do the same thing with a simple window, which is this window right here. As you can see, it's got the minimize, maximize, X. These are the sunken in edges. They're resizable. It's just basically what you expect out of a really generic window and not just a message box. You can see there's a fair amount more code here. Oops, it's just that right there, a couple screenfuls of code. And then what they've done right here is they've just broken it down and separated what each little, going through basically chunk by chunk, which is really nice. Don't let it scare you, it's done pretty well. Um, this is a global, there's that const, just like I was saying. So what you have is you basically, in a nutshell, you come in and you create a Windows class, which is a lot like an object-oriented class without the behaviors. A lot of times they'll say, oh, it's not related to object-oriented. It, I think what they're saying is don't confuse it with like object-oriented programming per se, but there is a lot of overlap with the general concepts. And that's what's going on here. You're basically, you know, if you, this is a window class, it's right here based on this structure, which like I said, it's just like an object with only uh, member variables and no behaviors. You, when you want to do a behavior like register the class, you just, that's floating around out in the Windows API world, you know, in the Windows system itself, and you just pass this structure right here, the address of that structure, that's what the ampersand means in C is the address of, the address of this structure, so this first byte of this structure if that truly is the first uh, field of that structure which I think it is it will come in here in this size of win class which is you know however many bytes that is 
that that number will be the very first the basically the mailbox number of that value that is computed right there is going to be the first thing and then it knows that this is a, a number and then it knows to go a D word ahead and then it will get the style and then if it goes four more bytes past that it will get a long pointer to a function name you can kind of get used to these little prefixes in Windows Windows kind of like reinvented the wheel a little bit on some of this and for better or worse so this is long pointer which means 32-bit pointer or possibly 64-bit pointer but in Windows world it's gonna always mean 32-bit pointer actually um, that's the way that Windows keeps everything even in the 64-bit mode you kinda of have to like intentionally break out of the 32-bit world and they did that for simplicity simplicity and to keep it backwards compatible just like in this situation so a lot of this will apply either way but yeah long pointer to function name these low this lowercase Hungarian prefix and then win proc so you can see how that lines up this is count bytes this little CB prefix so you know it's counting bytes of extra window data extra class data um, the actual size of this structure and then we come down here H is for a handle to an instance which is a number kind of like a pointer but it's more like think of that H like a high level pointer not like a low level you know pointer arithmetic kind of pointer but it's just like a high level unique number for that the instance of your program and this is going to be a handle to an icon it's kind of like a pointer to an icon but it's like I said just a high level number instead handle to a cursor handle to a brush called background basically is what that's saying so handle H brush is like a handle to a brush type that's what they're casting this number to it's kind of bizarre but whatever um, long pointer to a, a string zero so that's a, a C string that's why we add the zeros to the end which C automatically adds that null zero that slash zero effectively to the end of all your strings well in uh, instead of doing like a semicolon or something you could think of I guess in assembly language we just automatically add that zero and then icon small so that is basically doing the same thing as up here is that handle the icon that's the little icon that you'll see in the corner of the window right here and then the big icons like your alt tab icon basically uh, they're used in different forms across windows but those are two popular places to see them and then what they're doing right here is they're just registering this this form it's basically like you go to the doctor's office or someplace mechanic whatever and you fill out some form they give you a clipboard that's what we're doing right here they're like what kind of window would you like it's like you know and you're going off of that and then you could think of like the API documentation as your uh, you know your menu which I did want to cover real quick if you go over to archive come on archive.org and the first thing you're gonna see is this big giant Wayback Machine search box but ignore that one and there's another one on here somewhere right here down below it a little bit and you want to search for MASM I don't know why my computer's running so slow and then you will eventually come to this next screen and probably this first result should be Microsoft MASM CD-ROM library right here this shiny disk there's other options and stuff throughout here but this is the one I'm talking about Microsoft A MASM by Scott Jones click on that one don't be fooled that it's a CD-ROM that doesn't necessarily mean it's 700 megabytes this is actually under 30 megabytes it was just easier at the time for them to include it on a single CD rather than a little stack of floppies. So, or 30 megabytes would actually be a fairly large stack of floppies. So that's probably why they did that. You can just click right here to ISO image, 26.9 megabytes. Click that, save file, and then uh, documents, downloads for this old thing. There it is, Revised Jones as ISO. I already downloaded it, but I'm going to download it again. Just takes a second. Even with my computer running slow, you can see it's already more than halfway done. Downloading probably less than a minute. 
and this is it's a considered like a student CD you can see right here Microsoft MASM 6.15 so it actually has the uh, slightly newer MASM version than the one that comes with MASM 32 so maybe a couple more processor optimizations or something like that um, it's an in-between choice between the MASM 8.0 that I showed before and like I said the 614 but there's other stuff on this CD drive so if I come here come on thing open this ISO like an archive you can download 7-zip if you need it to um, do that otherwise you can mount it like in Windows 10 I'm pretty sure it has a built-in maybe you might have to right click it or something and say mount this disk as a drive and then you'll have to go through your Windows Explorer do whatever you gotta do to find it you can see there's all this stuff a bunch of its redundant like I think these are the floppy disk versions of MASM 611 and then you can see there's MASM 615 this is like a whole nother sub CD this is what I'm kind of talking about right here um, and then here's ML6 615 all by itself so you can see here what if I go to okay what we can do is just I'm gonna go back up here to all to this one actually nope sorry to this one and I'm gonna extract all this stuff extract to and I've already extracted it somewhere before Uh, let me browse to that you can click right here to make a new folder somewhere too I'm gonna go to my computer um, C so it's this MASM 611 folder that's where I've extracted it to before now I'm gonna just tell yes to all to override all the junk I already had in there so once again that's within you know here we're in that revised Jones uh, AS.ISO thing and then you go into this MASM 615 folder right there and that's what I just unpacked all this other stuff I don't know you can go through it there's all sorts of trippy stuff um, buried in here and then if you want to grab these two MLs that are a little bit newer you can just control C or actually not in the I'm not in a Windows Explorer I'll just go to highlight those two hit extract and then if I go to my MASM32 bin folder and then I can just extract them there say yes overwrite what's in there if you're worried about it go in and make a backup of 614 I don't think you'll be I haven't been able to link um, on the same command line with this even though it's you know just an incremental slightly incremental version higher this is a doc file with one of the old MASM references you might want to extract it maybe use an office program to convert it to a PDF whatever there's also nicer PDFs floating around on the internet already okay all that being said I'm gonna close this out close that one and this goes into a little so this was registering that window class filling out that form we're at the top of win main so you can see we come in here they have one come on thing Wow they have one global variable right there and then we come into win main or no this is a window procedure they just have it defined a little ahead of time so they don't have to use a prototype but anyway we come down here to win main this is where windows is effectively going to drop in right here and then it defines a few local variables including that window class which we're using right here and then we're going to step one fill out that form step one and a half actually call register pass it the address of that window class and if it's not um, if it returns a you know a negative kind of a value like a non truthy value then we're, we got an error so it's gonna come in here and call a message box with no owner window and it's gonna pass it these strings and it's gonna do a icon explanation blah 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 and then um, so that's just a simple error check and then right here it says okay your form looks good now let's feed that data into the, the machine that goes burr right and it's gonna shoot you out a window if everything works out alright so right here that's what happens they if all goes well it's gonna return you a handle to that window right there this would probably oftentimes be a capital W to follow that form above for handle to window but just as often you'll see it all lowercase or whatever um, 
it's calling create window extended this little ex was basically when it went from like the windows the old school 80s early 90s windows was like create window and then when windows 95 windows nt that kind of stuff which is what we're using now effectively is that api that's when these extended things happen you don't always need the extended option when it's available for different api functions but in this case that's how you get at least that small icon i'm not sure if it does a whole lot that i can remember off the top of my head but yeah for sure it gives you this small icon that otherwise create window wouldn't give you and you can always look that up in the api documentation just by simply if it's something like that that's obvious you just double click it right click search the internet for it probably pop up bam create windows ex right here but that's microsoft uh embedded edition we'd want this one and if you're using unicode then you'd want the w one you know it's kind of weird that that and just in general creating windows like that documentation's right there but yeah we are using create window exa so and if you wanted like i said the unicode ish one you'd do the w for the wide character and then you can see all the basic syntax come down here you can see right here the types of everything d word long pointer to string all that good stuff and even like i said long pointer 32-bit value that's a double word of words two bytes times double times two is four four bytes is a is a 32-bit value so since we know that's how you kind of come to that conclusion there and you can just get descriptions of what what's lp window name the window name the windows if the window style specifies a title bar the window title pointed to by lp window name is displayed in the title bar da, da, da. it just it will walk you through each one of those like if you're foggy on all that kind of stuff and also it's just good to there's lots of other various reasons like you might come down here whoa is that part of user 32 yeah it is so right here the library you need to include user 32.lib the actual file on your system that's going to link to a runtime would be this one um, the header file by just including windows h windows h will in turn include windows user dot h i don't know why the formatting's off there but uh yeah you could just include windows user dot h but most people in c programming will just at least just include that windows inc of course we need to include um user 32 dot inc in the uh MASM context because it's a little more specific and that was one of the reasons too why I couldn't view the assembly listing because of the this high level way that that stuff was included you go back to that recent file simplest before when we had the ink files it was just dumping in like tons of megabyte I mean a handful of megabytes millions of bytes worth of just this kind of looking stuff you know so uh we only need this one line right here. We didn't need the all the garbage because our program's so small and simple. So since I did thin out all that garbage, what I can do is come over here and generate this long listing. And this is the same thing as calling ML with the forward slash C, forward slash capital. Well, I'll just show the line instead of. If we call ML. You can see, so right here we have generate listing. So it's forward slash capital F lowercase L. And then right here to maximize the source listing to get that long format, that's that one. So I pass both those and then I pass the seed so that it doesn't try and link it. And that will generate a listing file, which should be, if you don't pass it a file name, it should be the same name as your AMS ASM file, but with a .lst style ending. So that would be a listing for that one. I've got a few listings in there already. I've got one there. So that's what's going on whenever I go here and go to generate long listing. It's basically running that and then opening it in a notepad. And the reason I use Notepad to view it is because they it uses tabs instead of spaces, and one of the worst situations I think to even use tabs when they're expected to be hard coded to like eight spaces. So Notepad's lightweight and quick, and it 
has that stupid formatting they're expecting. So it's just more readable even than having syntax highlighting. Okay. Well, as opposed to having syntax highlighting if it was properly tabbed out in whatever environment. So this is doesn't do much good with what I just did because I already coded in low level, so you're not going to see much of anything where it's translated here. You can just see that it's like where it's whatever I typed is getting converted directly into whenever you see these kind of numbers over here, those are saying that like that's the machine code that it got converted to. And then down here is some stats that are all lumped together for easier digestion, I guess. But that's one way to get a listing file of your stuff without actually, you know, the cool thing though, what I need to show you with that is that if you do, where's one? see what this so if this was using the invoke hmm I know I've got one that so I don't have to retype anything simple win message box maybe this message box will just happen to show so this shows you how bad the formatting is without that tab thing so that one doesn't have invoke either well anyway if you do that listing like I showed you and you use that high level invoke syntax then it will show you breaking it down to like the pushes and the call like I transformed to manually by hand it will show you that and you'll be able to find that in there and it's pretty cool okay so that's enough about all that stuff so then it's coming in create window some of this is kind of redundant with the last thing it's just like where do you want the window positioned stuff like that um, the title of the window and then right here it's just another error check and it's checking if that hwin value that you can see right here we got the hwin from the previous call and then immediately after this little block is checking if that's null that means the window creation failed so it doesn't have this windows binary window handle to to work with so in that case we just say hey it failed give a readable error message and bounce return zero probably want to return one or something to signify that not everything went well and then right here it's actually going to try and display the window and refresh it and then if all that goes well then right here it's going to uh, it's going to loop it's just the while loop and it's going to get messages from windows when it says get message it's events if you think of it like a you know maybe like a stage with a play and actors on it then you know you do have your line by line stuff where the actors are just reading their lines but there might be like some part in the script where they need to stop and listen for like a dog bark and then react to that and so that's kind of what goes on with event based programming you have to have this loop where you're listening for something and you're not going to listen for long in most cases because there's going to be especially once there's any like mouse moving over the screen the window you're going to start getting bombarded with messages that are telling you hey the mouse moved and it was right here when it moved if you ask it where it was and da, 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 and this button was down and then it moved over this far and then it let that button up all those little granular details you want you can listen for whatever you care about or you can ignore the vast majority of it but anyway this is that simple little while loop it comes in here gets a message it passes it the address of that message variable that we created earlier msg and this is kind of just the typical way that this is done is you especially if it's like a structure or something you pass it as a parameter instead of getting the return value and assigning that to message like you would probably do in object oriented and more higher level programming languages c is still a little bit low level so and then you use the return code as like an error code or success code or whatever, you know, like a sentinel value kind of a thing. That's what you'll usually use the return code for. That's why you'll see like, the like why are they passing the address to the message? That's why, because it's technically these days, if you're to design a system, you wouldn't really 
especially from any kind of a higher level perspective, you wouldn't want to pass it like that you, because that's a that's called a side effect where something within this scope is getting changed mysteriously behind the scenes by whatever's in that scope. Um, but if you know, so like I said, the better thing to do would just be assign it to something, you know, and that's why you'll see like try catch error blocks and stuff like that in more higher level languages is because that they're kind of shifting everything over and they're using the try catch constructs to catch error messages instead of following this sort of older pattern right here. And then this nulls just like a zero. It's, this is just all boilerplate to pass to get message, right? So you can ignore that. And basically, so it's calling get message, passing it the address of the message so that it can work with it. And then when get message returns, whatever return value it does return right here in its place, that needs to be greater than zero or else that means that we need to, we're done. So skip the while loop and return the W param of that message, which there's an L param and a W param, not worth stressing on right now, but they're, um, they're just two extra 32-bit parameters that go along with the messages. So right here we have translate message. All that's doing is translating. If you hit a particular keyboard key, the scan code for that code is getting converted into like its textual representation because, you know, uh, not much you probably want to do with the scan code and it's less portable and stuff. So it's pretty typical to see that right there and then dispatch message is just going to ask windows hey call the uh, window or window procedure callback you know check this out and call our window procedure callback with it and it's just going to do that over and over so it's basically just getting a message and dispatching it to the window procedure so we come back up here this window procedure which is just this stuff right here it just comes in it gets past handle the window the parameters stuff like that those matter if you care about the window you know like handle the window especially if you're doing stuff you'll just pass that around even if you have one window that's your handle to it you know but you can use the same window procedure for multiple windows so that's why that seem, might seem redundant at first but that's why that's there and then the unsigned integer message these are all d words of course these are all just 32-bit integral kind of values um, this message is all it's going to do is come in here and do the switch case on it right here right so it comes in here it says hey in case that message matches a wm close value that wm's like window message prefix right all this is in the api documentation then go ahead and do a destroy window and if so that will in turn call our window procedure back almost seemingly redundantly right with the WM destroy message which in which case we'll call post quit message and pass it a zero and that will effectively return a zero down here so get message will no longer be greater than zero and then it will skip out and it will pass a message W param which I believe I might have the return values flipped right there or something. But anyway, that's, you know, for the most part, that's what happens. If you really want to make sure I'm right or wrong about exactly how it's going down, then just look in the API documentation. And then if we don't, if it's a message that we didn't capture in here, we don't even need to capture this close one because in the type of window we're going to produce, it will automatically uh, call the WM destroy and all that stuff. So that's kind of redundant. Um, but otherwise it will call this default case. This is kind of like the else of an if else, if else, if else, then uh, return whatever, pass it to default window procedure, which is Windows has its own window procedure, like the Windows system itself. And that's how like a lot of times when you hit like minimize or maximize, they're just like, hey, that's something that every window should be able to do. You know, unless you want to do it in your own custom way, then you could handle that message, right? But otherwise, all that stereotypical kind of behavior you can just uh pass that off you know and then you're just effectively passing all those same parameters you're just effectively just skipping out on the message and you i would think in just about every single program in existence you do that if you really saw the amount of messages going through you're going to do that more often than not without even realizing it so anyway you just think of a like a net 
that has just the right holes to catch the messages you care about and everything else passes through to that and then after it's all done it returns a zero says everything's okay otherwise if it does end up having to call the default window procedure then instead it will return whatever value was returned from default window procedure all right that's it and that's more or less what's said in here they have a simple explanation of what each one of those parameters was or the field values for the uh, registering the class then the creating the window um, always check the return values that's a good call describing the message loop so if you need any more detail or just another once over on that that's the place to get it I'm going to come up here now and grab this from the bottom up right click and copy come over here open a new file and paste it in there and we'll start out with this in the C syntax highlighting and there you can see there's the message loop going back up in reverse order and then here's where we passed in that window class um, or we registered the window and then after that the step two we created we attempted to create a window with that class name right here and see if we get a handle to a window back and if it's null or zero that means that we didn't get a handle to a window back so complain we come up here here's where we actually registered and checked the window class filled out that form registered it by passing the address to that first byte which is actually the count of bytes most likely to the uh, of the actual structure right here and then we you know whatever that returns right here will be replaced with that this all will be replaced with its return value and then that will be negated with this not operator so if that returns true then that will flip that and make it false and that would be if false so it would skip this because this returned a truthy value but if this returns a so-called falsy value then it, this will flip it negate it and make it a true value and therefore if true will make it run and do the op you know so it just reads if not register class true <laughs> you know or if register class is false then complain and that's all this win main we of course declare like you know that handle to the window that we use later down there we declare you know in higher higher level languages or newer versions if you're don't care about 100% ANSI C89 compatibility you can of course define those variables down lower but generally a good idea to declare them at the top even if you can get away with otherwise for various reasons especially when we're working on the low level so we got that window class we got that handled the window and then of course that window message in the order that we deal with those and there's the incoming parameters and here's that callback thing that our window procedure which just captures those messages we care about all right so let's flip this into that high level assembly first thing put the boilerplate at the top model flat standard call by default option case map and then none which basically just says hey don't mess with the casing we want everything to literally be like it is, so then we'll include our ASM32. I'll do forward slashes this time just to illustrate that it's possible. That's an ink instead of the H file. And then we know we're going to have to at least have user 32 in there because we're showing windows like displaying windows and typical windows stuff that's all going to come out of user 32 and therefore we also need to include the lib for it and I can even still put the drive in front of it and use the forward slashes there Ooh, my editor let me switch this to assembly maybe it'll leave us alone okay so assembly and then this is going to be in the lib folder and it's going to be user 32.lib and then like I said you can just do const come down here get rid of character and instead of doing character and all this we just do 
define bytes and then a uh, character is eight bits on most C systems then we tail that off with that zero that um that null character and then right here step four the window procedure go ahead and make that nice and bold with assembly language comments instead and we can get rid of a lot of this too this L result is kind of like an integer or D word return value so we know that that's going to end up in EAX or whatever we don't even care and callback is that evaluates to a standard call in the header files so there's always a possibility I think one of the reasons they call it callback maybe is so that it's maybe more readable I think it just adds to the complexity but um and in the future they could change that you know in 64-bit windows programming where it isn't shouldn't be standard call anymore at least to my knowledge um stuff like that you know it it sort of floats you above that it abstracts you above that but anyway we know it's a standard call so we're low level people here and we're going to do a procedure and that whole thing should be familiar by now we can just paste this and all these are d words too so if I wanted to, I could just pick colon D word here, but I'm going to go ahead and leave these for now. Just flip them around, do the straightforward, simplest, fastest kind of thing. And get rid of that opening brace there. Okay, so now what we have is a switch statement, but I mean, if you're using, I suggest staying away from the high level libraries that come with MASM, the so called MASM 32 package specifically. They, I don't know. It's just like they're, they're only in that world for the most part. Some of them I'd imagine you could use in other ways, but they're just so non standard. You know, they're, like I said, they're only in that MASM type of a context or 32 type of a con uh, context. Sorry. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do it in the way that would work on the ML file that comes with like Visual Studio 2019 or whatever, excuse me, you know, or 2010 or whatever version you happen to be using. This is the one that will, even MASM32, this will work with it. So what we're going to do is we'll just translate this into a, a dot if statement. Um, these little constructs, like if you don't put the dot in front of them, then they're assembly time. So it would be a conditional assembly instead of a condition evaluated at runtime. If we're going for that high level, if that we see in a C language, we need to do the dot. If we're going for like a preprocessor directive style one, the macro-ish style one, then you do just a regular if. But anyway, that's to explain that. So we say if that message compares to WM close, then we want to invoke destroy window and we're just could probably make a mechanical translator that would do this for you and since it's an if we don't need these breaks and that's indented a little too far there and so then this will become the dot else if msg is the case is the thing we're switching on and then if it's equal to that then we want to invoke post quit message and we don't need the break of course and then otherwise this would be the the else case this default else else return but since we get that's not a valid assembly language instruction right or statement what we can do is we can since we know the return value stored in EAX 99% of the time or whatever we can just get rid of this C style return put in our high level invoke and before I fix those up I'll just come down here and say ret and so it will just leave the return value in EAX and then by us calling the assembly style return we'll effectively get that value returned if that makes sense and we can do that and get rid of those and then this ends the if so we'll do an end if here give that a little bit of spacing and then same thing right here we can just XOR the EAX return register to get an effective zero in there very optimized and then this closing brace we'll just say 
wind proc and p and it's not case sensitive so you can do np lowercase uppercase with a lot of that stuff just whatever you feel like oops oh i haven't even saved this yet okay file save as asm this is um simple win Okay, same thing here we, on this uh, win API thing. We have a int we don't care about, and then win API, just like that other one was callback, win API, 32-bit context also changes the standard call by default, so we're good there. And we can, uh, as a matter of fact, even in Windows 64, I think you could just declare the default uh, calling convention as vector call and then pretty much follow the same style thing as much as you can get away with long pointer do a string all these of course still D words and this one is definitely a D word and you can do like a sign D word because that was a an int it wasn't an unsigned int so if you did want to be more specific you could do something like that and then this these are local variables we're just doing to the high level syntax right now which is really easy I'll cut that out and do local and then you're just flipping it here too so h win cut that out pretty straightforward Just like that, and then we'll convert this to an assembly style comment. Make it pop out a little bit more here. Okay, and then this one is more straightforward than it might seem. So we have that, we were in win main, we declared our local variables using the high level syntax, and then this. One good thing about the Intel style um, mnemonic syntax for assembly language programming where you pit the destination first is that it actually lines up with this pretty easy. So we can do a mov and then we can come over here and put a comma and then size of we can do it like that or whatever. And size of you can uppercase it or lowercase it, whatever you want. So we can just basically, for the most part, just do that down this whole thing, and that's effectively storing. It works out pretty nice. So mov, I did two spaces because if you're, you'll see a lot of times there'll be like a four-letter assembly language instruction. So by doing two spaces, it just kind of helps line up with that. I'm just going to do this more than I need to because I'm not even thinking about it. It's just easier to be like mechanical. If you have a really good editor and you're really good at using it, you probably know how to do multiple cursors or whatever and shortcut this, but do whatever you want. And then over here, we can just moving along generically, just double clicking that and hitting comma. Oops. And I, I'm going to have to go back and keep cleaning this up. I'm not doing it just right. These are optional, of course. They don't matter. Um, some of these things aren't valid arguments here. Get rid of those endings so I don't have to come back on those. All right. So that looks good. That looks good. Right here, wind proc, we need to look at for a hint of what they're expecting here because we can't just pass it that name like that. So long pointer to a function name. Okay, so they want a pointer. That's an address of, so we can use offset there. That will get us that address. Zero is fine, zero is fine. H instance. Okay, right here what we have going on is we're trying to copy a memory value into a memory value using the plain old mov command. That will not work. So what we do is we'll cut that out of there and it's pretty simple. We just push that value onto the stack and then we pop it right back off. And that's a little 
common trick, little common pattern to do whenever you need to do a real quick memory copy. There's other ways to do it too, but um, in this instance, that's the best way to handle that, I think. Okay, and then right here, we're call it, we can't call a function name like that. We're not in a high level language, right? So I'm gonna cut that out, but we know that whatever the result of that function is gonna be an EAX, unless otherwise noted. So we can invoke that ahead of time in the line before we can invoke it and clean it up to make it assembly style here. This null, we could just as easily say zero, make the line a little more compact maybe. And then right there we're pushing, we're uh, copying in that EAX value, pretty standard pattern. Right here, load cursor, same exact thing. Get rid of that, come up here. Oh yeah, we need to, uh, it's eventually gonna be an EAX, right? Paste that, invoke it. And then replace that with a zero, just to make it short and sweet. And that gives us our cursor. So whenever I start doing that, I'll usually come down and just kind of separate them a little bit so that they're more lumped together, how they're related like that. We can see right here, if we do a nice fat comment that, you know, this is all consistently the same phase. So then right here we have, uh, we don't need to get that cast. We just need that literal value, which is, I think, a six, if I remember correctly. Color windows five plus one, just weird little thing you've got to do to make that work. That should work fine. This null, we'll just make it a zero. And then right here we have uh, that class name, that global value up here. And so once again, it's gonna try and just, you know, as is, it's gonna do something funky, like try and just copy that string in there. So we need to change that to an offset. And we'd know if we got that weird indescriptive runtime error that it was probably we forgot something like that and then icon small well we already called load icon with IDEI application up here why would we want to call it again right there so we can get rid of that and we can just make use a little assembly optimization right here just make use of that EAX register like that so what's going on there is the return value of load icon stuck into EAX, right? And we're assigning it to H icon and then without moving any values or rerunning any functions, we're sticking it in H icon small too. So nice way to take care of that. That looks good, except for whatever I'm missing that the error codes should be nice, descriptive to tell me. So right here, we just gotta pull this and invoke it before we do the conditional on it. And this is the address, ADDR. We could use offset if it was a global variable, but since it's a local variable, we have to use ADDR. And that's a high level thing and that goes along with evoke, invoke, All right? And then if not, now we know that return value is gonna be an EAX, so we can just stuff an EAX right there, right? Oh yeah, and then we need to put a dot in front of the if so it's not conditionally assembled. And then we're going to invoke this message box. And I know that if you just put a zero here, it will give you an error by default. So then we don't even have to say error, save, save some stuff. And then out here, oh, message box okay, I'm pretty sure it's just a zero anyway, so they're oring with a zero, which is kind of pointless. It is does make the code a little more descriptive but I just happen to know that's unnecessary. And then return zero, of course, we just do that XOR EAX, EAX pattern and return that. And then right here will be the end of the if. Okay. Step two, create window. And of course, can't do this, but we can right after this function call right here, we can just say uh, move into that variable h wind um, the EAX, whatever's left in EAX. We'll invoke this. Put a comma here instead of that brace. And then all this should be able to stay the same. Um, I prefer, you know, like for one thing, I prefer to tab that stuff over twice. 
I need to change that string. And then just one parameter per line. I think it's just, in my opinion, more readable. Like that. So you can see I've got, that's pretty common too, is to at least double tab over, even though I am using tabs as spaces, but I'll double tab over. So two groups of four spaces to kind of get it under here and then just straight down in a line. This right here, title of my window. Just change that to window title or something on conflicting. Just one at a time as you come across those kinds of things. If you're in this situation, just do it like this. And you know what? I like their idea of prefixing with the G for global. So I'll go ahead and do that too. That way it's just more descriptive. We know it's a global variable and also, or, you know, if you want to think of it like a member variable loosely. And then it's also less likely to run into a name collision with a local. Okay, so this will be an offset. And then right here, same thing. This is going to be an offset because in C, it's normally passing by default any kind of a string like that. It, it's going to pass default the address of that first character. So we wanted to do that instead of literally passing the text of the string. All right. And these nulls could be zeros. Whatever, no big deal. H instance is okay as not as an offset because we want to pass that literal number that whatever we got, that's the number that Windows uses internally for it in this instance. And that's what we're gonna do there. So that looks good, I think. And then right here, we'll convert this to a dot if H win, this one stays pretty much the same. Um, so if we get a null return value on that H wind, then we know that that is uh, that something didn't go right. So we need to alert the user, get out of there. Message box A will say, if you know for sure the functions dealing with strings like this one is, then always go ahead and call A or W specifically. It'll, in my opinion, it just saves, I don't use the T characters or none of that stuff. It's just too vague. Okay, so this is creation failed. Control X that and say a G create failed. And then we know zero will give us an error title. G create failed. Since we're using the ANSI strings, that's how we get away with that. Uh, Oops. Defining bytes. Otherwise, we need to define words. And then we can kind of keep this lined up and nice there. All right, come down here. Where are we at? Did I, I thought I cut that out. Did I down one more? I skipped that one, didn't I? I forgot to fix it. Okay, so create failed, da da da. This sucker back up here. Get rid of all that junk. Grab that junk and we'll say a mov into EAX a one, like I was saying to do earlier. And then we'll come back up to this one. We'll mov into EAX a one, which signifies that something probably went wrong. And then window registration failed. Window creation failed, so we never did a window registration. We'll do a control X G registration. It's also good to do really long names for globals too. Anything that you consider to be global. Registration failed. Right. What else here? Just about done with it. Come down here. Okay, I need to close off this dot end if 
give it some space to invoke this stuff, invoke that stuff. Shouldn't need any offsets for this stuff. Right here is going to be a problem. We'll need to I think with the way that I'm doing it. Go ahead and do that. Okay, this wild one is tricky. This got me earlier. You can't, even though you got a call get message here, I just habitually want to stick it like I do with the if statements or whatever right above it and that led me into all kinds of trouble so what you do is while one which is basically the same thing as saying while true and then inside of that while loop we want to do that we want to invoke get message and then this is going to be the adder the address of message null null zero zero all that can stay pretty much the same we'll turn that to a zero and then we come down here and we do dot break dot if eax is greater than zero so what's going on there is uh let me get rid of this junk and kind of move the screen down a little bit what's going on there is this is a special shorthand break format is you know break obviously works just like break in the higher level language what do you think of but to be able to put this conditional after it is sort of a shorthand thing so that instead of typing like dot if um, you know eax is uh, greater than zero and then come down in here and then put dot break and then like dot end if like that it's saving from having to do all of that kind of a thing there All right, where am I at now? So that's going to invoke get message, then it's going to break if. So that's all effectively doing what it was doing up there. Then we need to invoke these. Translate message. That's going to be an adder because message is local. Same thing right here. We can only get away with that with the invoke syntax. This is going to be the end while closing. And then we're going to, since we want to return that message parameter, we can just say mov into EAX. We know that that's a 32-bit T word, like I said before, so it'll fit in EAX. And we can just put it right there and convert that to that. And then this is the uh, win main end P. And then we're going to end start there. Okay, scanning back up through this. So that's that final return value from win main. This is that message loop that's going to get the message and then it's going to translate the keyboard stuff and then it's going to dispatch it to that window procedure at the top. Um, we're invoking show and refresh the window right there after we check and make sure that we actually got a window handle to deal with, which was stored from the return value from this immediately previous invoke call to create window ex which is taking the name and the title and all that kind of stuff and an instance then right here it was checking to make sure that the class was actually registered and fed into the system properly and this was that form to fill out for the type of window we wanted with what type of icons and stuff but you can look these up in the Windows API documentation and change them to whatever you want. And that's the local variable syntax for those variables we use just inside of WinMain. And we pass two other functions as necessary. All right. And then here's that main Windows procedure. It comes in. If the message is closed, then call destroy window, pass it the handle to this particular window. Otherwise, um, if the message is this one, which we'll get right after in that case. Post quit, quit message, and otherwise if all else fails, excuse me, pass it to the default Windows procedure handled by Windows internally, and let it do its thing and return whatever value it returns to us there. And 
if we did handle it ourselves up here without returning, then we'll just go ahead and put an AOK -OK zero in the EAX register and return right there. All right. The other thing I need to do right here is actually put a, oops, I don't like having tons of extraneous space here. So I need to make this a dot code section here. And then we also need to do a start. I'm going to wrap effectively be wrapping this win main with the start which MASM seems to figure that out if I don't give it startup code and just pass it win main I don't I still don't totally understand how this works but I can just do that and it will kind of like C programming style it will call win main apparently so let's see if I somehow manage to do this without any errors of course not so undefined symbol WC, that's not the first error though. It's the first error up here. Line 42, syntax error, H instance. So it's one by one from the top of that stack of errors. 42, H instance, win main. I forgot to do a proc. Okay. I was trying to link. Something's not going right. Or did it link and now it's trying to run? So, what I do is I right click, check task manager, order that by name. You can see simple win got left open. Yes. So, we didn't get any specific error. We didn't get an ambiguous error that would make me think it's a pointer error. So, what's going on is it's the display of the window because actual programs running, we're just not seeing the window displayed here. So, if we comb down through it, but the problem is, is that because I just wrapped this start thing, it doesn't really have a good default way. I think with that simple window in Jeff Wang's um, text, I think that one should display because he passes a WS visible symbolic constant somewhere in there, and that makes it automatically display. But what we should be able to do is just make this a show window show normal or show default and then I'm just going to comment that one out that's we'll see here in a minute okay there it appeared and went away so that means there's something going on with uh with this right here so if I'm trying to remember what caused that It's doing show normal and then it's going away and that's because something's going on in here so we're not getting an error when we register the class so we know we're making it that far we saw the window appear for a second then we come down here we do the create window that seems to work no errors we never got the this message box so then we're getting here to show window and that's where stuff's going wrong. Let's try a show window show default. Went away. So it's something to do with this message loop. So while true, invoke get message with the address of the message and break if EAX, maybe break if not EAX. Okay, there's something about that now it's working. So what it was was uh, this here. I wonder if we say, if we wrap it like that. Nope. Huh. So there's something wrong with that syntax. It didn't cross over to uh, to assembly just right. But we can get away with by just saying if not EAX. And then you can see this window's resizable. Maximize, minimize. All that kind of stuff close it and then you know just remember if you're doing that you do the slash c ml slash c slash cough the assembly file name and then on the next command you'd run link forward slash subsystem colon windows and then space and the same file name but dot obj i'm going to just check right here right click on the taskbar 
come over to processes, sort by image name, and make sure there's no like simple win, no instances left over. Probably complain if there was. So there you can see that's to convert it to that that more uh, high level assembly. I mean, it translated for the most part almost straight across, arguably from C. I mean, a C programmer, I think, in one day could be almost comfortable with what they're seeing right there. But that being said, from an assembly language perspective, it's almost like too high level in a lot of ways. But what you can do is you can write, you can convert your whole program or think it out, hash it out in this high level type of form. And then you can go in to specific spots where you want to optimize that, you know, I think the biggest closest thing we have here is maybe, you know, like right here, we knew where that return value was stored and it's just easier to do that. And when you do a register, memory to memory, is gonna be the longest slowest thing like right here where you're pushing and popping to and from memory I mean in like it happens just literally at just light speed right virtually approaching light speed but when you're trying to do it a lot like if you one of the reasons to use assembly obviously is to zoom in and like really just pick apart a little spot where after you profile your code get it working first then profile it and find out where those little bottlenecks are and then you can zoom in with assembly that's these days especially a lot more people will use like what are called compiler intrinsics I'm not a huge fan of that stuff like I don't know I guess they have their place I haven't really looked into them too heavily but the next option staying in the high level realm would be like inline assembly where you actually like encode assembly language within like a C or C++ or whatever source file and then of course what we're doing is even a step further out than that step lower level even though we're using the high level syntax within MASM but as far as relatively speaking to high level programming languages themselves we're bringing it down a notch lower to where it's almost like you have the ability to do inline assembly like more instantaneously like on the spot and uh, we know every little thing like there's tons of like wrapper code so to speak going on with C where like there's all sorts of setup and destruction code and libraries you're depending on more libraries in general and stuff so there's just as fast as C is when compared to a lot of the other options it still is very bloated when you start comparing it with like some lean and mean assembly code so anyway, maybe that got you up to speed with this. Of course, we could change this even to Tiny's another option. Don't forget. Um, apparently not. <laughs> Cannot access label through segment registers. So maybe Tiny doesn't work right there. I think there is a way to get it to work like that because this shouldn't be over the top. But anyway, you can see all that. See the you know go through and put nice big fat comments like this wherever you need them so I'm gonna just as one last closing example show you right here where we can just go through and even more better document this like I don't know I think that's pretty obvious that those are local variables I'm not gonna do that but as far as this window um, these windowing constructs like register the window class yeah and then we get down here like what's going on right there let's just say that this is register and check check for error so what's going on there and we're creating the window and then right here what are we doing right there we're uh, check for creation error Say check for window creation error. And then right here we're displaying the window, right? Display window. So you can format stuff or do it however you want, of course, but that's just one example of how to do that nice and big and bold like that. And then you can just just go through that's the best thing in the programming if you can't figure out what's going on so that's a pretty straightforward procedure regit fill out that clipboard um, you know call this function right here to register you know to punch that that clipboard information into the system so to speak 
check if there was an error returned. If there was, then go ahead and call a message box with an error. And then if all that went well, then hey, let's try and create a window out of that information. And so we create a window, then of course we're going to check that EAX register, store it into HWIN, like taking that first step, assuming, hey, this could be good, and then uh, check that for an error. What you could do too, I guess, as an optimization is maybe um, check the EAX for null right here, and then if that's not true, then come down here, but really it's better to just immediately store that EA, that register is probably one of the more volatile or most volatile registers in the system. So it's best to, to probably just get it stuffed into a variable right away. But if you were going to make that trade off and say, hey, I know what happens in this block of code, you know, that it's not going to get run unless there is a problem with the AX. So I should be able to do this comparison value, whatever then you could do that and that would save you, especially if you're running this loop like a thousand times a second potentially or something and you want to make sure that, you know, you're not copying from EAX into into memory. That's slow, remember, relatively speaking, when you're doing something a zillion times a second. So you could, that's an optimization you can make. I could be totally wrong about that. Sometimes I'll think I see an optimization like that and then you go to try and implement it and you're like, oh, whoa, wait. Or I'm like, I should say. Anyway, maybe that helped you out. And thanks for watching.